All right, here we go. What's good, everybody? I'm Robert Dickens Jr. This is Ryan Reed. This is Elanders Frazier. This is John Gall, and you're listening to Volta. Changing the conversation for percussion educators, designers, and performers. 100? Yeah. For people who are just joining us, Ryan applied for 200 jobs right out of college and did not get one. Don't go into music ed. <laughs> Welcome, folks, to Volta Percussion. <laughs> <laughs> on tonight's episode and then it clips to ryan i applied for 200 jobs and i didn't get any music education sucks breaking news <laughs> music education and me <laughs> that's a good title that is a good title <clears throat> All right. Anyway, sorry, Ryan. Please continue. Tell us your story, Ryan. Oh, um, so <laughs> I I uh, graduated from college in 2010, and out of college, over like I graduated with a five year teaching license. Um, so over those years, I applied for like 200 and some jobs obviously all of them in music education and not all of them just in Ohio, but I applied all over the country um, and never got one. So, I mean, for me, you know, music education has to be a job of passion, you know, whether you're going into band or being a band director or, um, choir director or orchestra director or whatever. Um, But also you gotta, you gotta go in and have a backup plan, which is obviously what I've kind of moved to in doing, you know, the freelance percussion director designer stuff, because just because you go to school for music education and just because all of your professors tell you there'll be jobs in music education, and just because all your advisors go, there will definitely be jobs in music education. You know, there won't be, you know. Um, like in Ohio, when I graduated, everyone was like, uh, there will be, there's a surplus of teachers that are getting ready to retire. And they weren't wrong at the time, but it was like my fourth year or fifth year of college where Ohio changed the law for retirement for teachers from 30 years to 35 years. So all those teachers that were getting ready to retire got slapped with not quite yet. <laughs> that sucks. It left, <laughs> it, dang. It left, it left like, like my class and the classes right after me um, in a position where like, you know, if you wanted to teach band in Ohio, there weren't jobs. Because now band directors had to go longer in their jobs, um, and nobody was going to, ret- like, you could still retire at 30, but to get the average of, like, your three best years or whatever it is, from a salary standpoint, you had to go to 35. So that's kind of that's kind of how I ended up where I'm at. Like, I, I went to school for music education. I like had every intention to be a band director coming out of college, going into college. Um, and then, you know, for five years applying for like 200 and some jobs. And, and I had two interviews. And in one of those interviews, I got asked, so you're a percussionist. Do you think you can teach wins? Um, so clearly I was, I was a highly sought after candidate in that program, uh, being a percussionist. Um, but no, I mean, you got to understand as a, as a music educator, like there are, there are schools that know who they're going to hire and you get an interview out of like, that's what they have to do. Not just, hey, these are all the applicants we want to interview. Nope, this is a stack of people that we're going to interview, but we want this guy. So I would encourage everyone going into music education, know how to run yourself as a business. Like know how to, or have an idea of like how to set up a studio, how to set up a website, 
how to like market yourself because my college experience did none of that for me everyone Mm. said you are gonna have a job after college little did they know not everybody had a job coming out of college and music is the first thing cut everywhere this is true so yeah i it's it's interesting that you that you said a lot of things about knowing how to market yourself because i really feel like that's important even though i was a music industry major at troy um the person that was running the program uh robert w smith obviously is a music educator for years and composer and all that kind of stuff but uh, one of the things that I can say that I definitely took away from that experience was that he did work with us a lot on how to present ourselves, how to make ourselves marketable. Um, even though I guess at the time I wasn't really marketing myself as a music educator, but just thinking along those lines of like people wanting to engage with you based on what they see. Because I mean, we could, I think we can all agree that as much as people want, supposedly air quotes, want great educators, they also want a, a look or an aesthetic. Like they're looking for a person that looks a certain way, or like you said, Ryan, that like fits into whatever this system is that they have of like, I want people that went to this school, or I want people that look like this, or I want people that have a good social media following. I mean, companies do it all the time. One company that will remain nameless, um and they're not the only ones tons of other uh uh companies that do this i mean and and here's the thing as shallow as that feels i get it because like that's just being a human being you know what i mean like no of course you want to judge someone by their heart but you are going to look at what they present to you first just in general like i mean that's the reason why we don't walk around naked right oh i, I think everyone like sees my heart like, no, I think we see that you don't have any clothes on. That's kind of weird. So could you go back and put some on? Like, that's that's a bit much. So, I mean, there's, there's no sense in saying that, like, obviously no one cares about, like, the, the way that you present yourself. However, I do think that you have to have that, that substance as well, um, especially if you're going to be a music educator. But... I think it's a little bit different, like Ryan saying, I'm thinking about the online side of it. I'd imagine it's probably a little bit different trying to get hired as a music educator in this age where there's social media and there's other things for you to promote yourself and market yourself versus another situation where they don't even know what you look like coming in, like you're just kind of fresh off the street type thing. So Mm -hmm. I do think that we should be like social media savvy, those that are going to go into music education, like you should give off that vibe, obviously, that you're a good educator, that you care about students. Like you can't be, you know, trash mouth all on social media and then think you're gonna get a job or whatever. Like, I think all those things matter is what I'm saying, so. I, I think <clears throat> it all comes down to who you know, just like everything else in life. My idea is, I believe people should not get a music education degree. They should go get a degree in something else. And we could talk about that later in this podcast. You do have to have some type of degree or certification if you want to teach music in a school district. It's just, that's the law of the land. You have to play by those rules. But I think when it comes down to getting a job, I think it's more about your connections. <clears throat> like for me, I I went and got my performance degrees in South Carolina and in Texas. I'm originally from Georgia, uh, and I liked Texas, so I stayed. Uh, but I didn't have an education degree that I can go right out of the gate. Even though I had a master's, I couldn't go right into the gate and just start teaching in a school district. One, because I didn't have the certification of music ed. And two, because I didn't really know that many people. Now, I've done drum corps and indoor, and I've taught for a long time, and I was fortunate to connect with somebody. I think I saw something in one of the Facebook posts of someone, you know, you know there's tons of Facebook groups for every state on, you know, 
percussion educator, percussion educators or band directors or whatnot for techs or job openings. And so I found one that was for some assistant percussion director at a high school. And so I went in and interviewed and uh, I guess I think maybe it was a little bit of my personality and just how we, we were able to connect. But that's kind of how I got my foot in the door is uh, they knew some of the teachers I had for indoor, like with Mystique and then some of the drum corps techs I had, <clears throat> excuse me, for Cavs. And that's kind of how I got my foot in the door. And I was able to just the tech for them. And then over a period of time, right now I'm working on my online certification because of this whole pandemic, I want a safer job and just getting paid to tech a couple hours every week. Uh, so in that regard, I have to get that certification, that diploma. But all in all, I, it all came down for me getting that job being my foot in the door. It came down to just knowing some people. I think at the end of the day, you kind of just need that. So we got connections, look, knowledge, all this stuff. What else we missing? No, I definitely, you know, I would say for, you know, the hopeful music educators, like, you got to know what the dog and pony show is, you know, because it's, especially in the job interview, you know, I thinking back to, to my interview situations, the few that I've been in and whatnot, and, you know, John, I don't know what your, maybe you can talk about your experience interviewing, but like there weren't a ton of questions about like pedagogy and anything like that, like teaching experience and all of those things, because those are all on your resume. It's more of like, how would you handle this situation or how would you change the program or what would you do with this or what would you do with that, you know? again, kind of to Robert's point where it's like they're trying to find somebody that's going to answer in a way that fits their program, and rightfully so, it's their program, um, almost more so than they're looking for, like, the best teacher. Is that kind of your experience with, like, the job interview? Right. I, I, think, I think, number one, they're just trying to find, like you said, someone that they feel comfortable working with. Because with any job, you're going to be spending hours, especially in the music field, you're going to be spending hours in that band hall, football games, traveling. Do they like you as a person? Do they feel comfortable around you? And then, uh, again, they're going to do their background checks on, on your, because mm -hmm. they've read your resume. They know your the references. They, they've called those people. But they want to kind of get to know you as a person. And then they'll ask you maybe some situational questions. What are you going to do in this situation? How would you improve our program? Because I think to a certain extent, it's like running a business. And you've, you've mentioned this before. Like, they want to see what value you're going to bring to the table compared to someone else. And do they feel comfortable leaving you alone with their students and knowing that those students are going to get better because you have the knowledge, number one, and number two, you just have that, I don't know, that, that camaraderie, that persona to motivate people to get better. So mm -hmm. I think it also comes down to, do you have something to give to the program to make them better, to make them run like a business? Maybe they don't have, the band director doesn't have to do as much work, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think... I think business aptitude and the aptitude to be able to carry yourself in that manner is so underlooked in terms of uh, extracurricular activities. And I'm, and like, I talk about, we, we, we talk about music educators because obviously that's the source of this podcast, what brought us all together, what we do, you know what I mean? Like all this kind of stuff put together. But like when we talk about just like anything that's extracurricular where you're the sole responsible person for a group of individuals, even when we're talking about traveling team sports, et cetera, et cetera, you've got to understand how to run a business from financials, from communication and contact, from setting up rehearsals, how to organize parents, how to organize 
uh, uniforms, practice schedules, uh, performances, competitions, like all of those different tasks come into play when you are trying to functionally do that as a career, whether it's a side hustle or whether it's a primary career, right? So we talk about, you know, like band director, music educator, what can you bring to the table? They're looking at your high school coaches in the same frame of reference. Like if you're going to be a high school coach, I want to know, can you eventually become the athletic director? And if you are, that means you're going to be managing the entire athletic budget of the school. Same thing with your band director. Can you become the music department head? Meaning that you're going to be managing all of the different music sections. If you're in a very, you know, maybe you're in a very large school where you have a chorus department and, you know, multiple music departments, et cetera, et cetera. Like, can you eventually take over this entire program and, and manage all of these different staffs? So, you know, it's weird sometimes to where like when we talk about education and we talk about what is the thing that encompasses all of that why is business and that aptitude kind of left out of the equation sometimes in terms of how do we manage other people because management is a skill set that is it's uh it can be utilized everywhere it doesn't matter where you're at because you think about it like what is a principal doing but managing other people? What is a dean doing but managing students? What is a teacher doing but managing a classroom? Like all of these different roles comes down to managing people in some capacity one way or another. So those skills are transferable, to, you know, regardless of where you're at. And I think that if we took some of that priority and shifted it just even slightly and made sure that it was integrated, you know, all the way throughout you know, that undergrad and making sure that they understood this was an expectation coming into it, then they would have more to speak on as they get into, you know, coming out of that degree program and moving into those jobs, or at least understanding that, hey, when I go start looking for these positions, whether it's an internship, et cetera, these are things that I need to be paying attention to, not just what are they teaching in the classroom, but also how are they handling situations with parents? How are they handling situations with other administrators? How are they handling situations with other staff members? How are they handling situations? You know what I mean? Like all those other little tidbits that are not just about the music, that are not just about the game, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think, I think that's all super important. But the issue, and I'm going to play a devil's advocate here, is – that's just another thing you have to add on to their curriculum. Right now, music education is like four years plus on what another semester for student teaching, unless you want to cram it in real hard, do three and a half years of teaching and excuse me, three and a half years of school and then a, a semester of student teaching. Four years is, is plenty of time to get all that curriculum in, but to, but you're pushing yourself. That's why a lot of students uh, are making it now like a five-year program. Like for music ed, they'll, they'll do four and a half years of, of school. And then that last semester is, is uh, student teaching. And that's why, and this is just personal preference, I think it's better to get a degree outside of music education, like business or whatever. And then if you really want to go be a music director, someone, all you need is really a certification. And this, it depends on the personality, but at least for me, and this is just pe speaking from my perspective, I was able to get, go through my online certification, go through all the classes that talks about management, the different types of student personalities, so forth and so forth. I was able to get that done in about a month, right? Now, I don't know all the intricate details about the instruments and how to play every single one because I didn't have to take a semester of rap and woodwinds and percussion and everything. I read all about that in my experience teaching and watching videos. That's kind of my experience. So I, I definitely suffer in that regard. But with my experience from the business side, I was able to get my music certification in a month. I'm studying for my test. I'll pass that. And then boom, I'm going to get a job. Instead of spending four or five years learning all this other stuff, I think 
I don't think you need to get a music education degree. That's so, what I'm saying. That's so what, what do you saying. say to those students that want to be invested inside of that full knowledge program? Well, then just know it's going to take four or five years of your life. And if you're cool with that, that's totally fine. Now, there are other ways you can do it. Like, again, you can get that online certification and you can take lessons, right? If you're getting a business degree, there's no problem with taking beginner French horn or whatnot for a semester. It's going to mean you have to work a lot harder, but welcome to life. I mean, that's just life. If you're not willing to work hard, then A, you shouldn't go into music because you're not going to get paid for your time and for your work ethic, okay? Uh, so that may be a, something else you have to look into. Mm, I, I agree. Um, I don't think that, that that's the path for everybody because at the end of the day, I think there are a lot of music educators that I will say that I've worked with that have – that are great music educators, but their programs are never maybe as successful as they could be because the managerial side of what they do is not there. Um, and obviously being that, I, I feel like some of it, some, some of the managerial side of it, I get from, you know, my own, uh, you know, family upbringing being that, you know, my parents are entrepreneurs, um, so growing up working in a business taught me a lot of things, um, but also the way that a drum corps was run, uh, just being in the activity, that taught me a lot of things. And then also, like I mentioned before, at Troy, the music industry program was, was kind of essential. I feel like probably if I wanted to be a music ed educator, I probably would have maybe been a music education major, but maybe got a minor in the music business side. Because regardless of what a lot of people may think about uh, some of <laughs> some people within the industry, they're successful for a reason. Um, they could be very successful teaching and they could also be very successful being a composer as well because they have certain skills that they possess, you know, and, and that they're comfortable using those things on a consistent basis so they created their own structure I feel like kind of kind of what some of the issue is is if you do want to be a music educator and just go into a system in a sense um sorry in a sense that that will work for some people just because maybe you can just follow things and just do exactly what they're asking you to do which will probably get you some level of success depending on the, uh, the personnel and the makeup of the, uh, the administration. But in order to be really successful, um, I feel like you're gonna have to go beyond just the musical knowledge. You're gonna have to have the personality, you're gonna have to have the charisma, you're gonna have to have the managerial skills in order to convince certain personalities as admin that are like you know hiring you you have to convince those people that you have the type of personality as to what they look for in a band because some people are really just if we're honest some people are looking for a band director that's just going to get more kids in band like that's it some some admin is looking for people that are gonna hey come out there and play a friday night like crowd pleaser show like that's what we want you know, so to be honest, there are a lot of things I think that can probably throw us off or that might throw future music educators off because you would think that the conversation is going to be about education in your interview, but more than likely it's probably not because they're not music educators. So they don't even really know or care about the things that we actually care about that are important to us. You know what I mean? They care about, again, what they perceive music to be within their school. So I feel like that's where the business side comes in and being able to play the game of understanding, well, what do people that are outside of the band world that we know and love, what do they think about bands? And what do they think a good band is? Because those people are gonna wanna hear that in order for you to get a job. But obviously, you know, when you get in there, you're gonna teach and do all the, you know, things that you need to do, but you kind of have to, like I said before, you have to get past the looks to get to know a person. 
I feel like the same way as far as getting a job, like people have to get through that superficial layer of what kind of person are you? If you were, uh, uh, if you were an animal in the jungle, you know, what animal would you be? Like, that means absolutely nothing, but they, they want to know, do you feel like you're a tiger? Are you a gazelle? Are you like, you know what I mean? Like all those weird psychological questions that they ask people sometimes in interviews, but well, I, think I, I don't know. Up, I think both of you bring up a really good point of, you know, I think people get into music education thinking it's all education and it's more mm. like BS management, you know, in terms, in terms of educating, like in terms of amount of teaching time, I probably teach more than the band directors I work with just because I, I walk in and I teach and that's my job and I get to leave. I don't have to deal with, you know, the emails from the parents and setting up the fundraiser and making sure that all the kids are on time and all of these things. I just have, you know, like I have my list of goals. I have the band director's list of goals. And then I figure out what we're going to do. And I teach that day to those goals or that week to those goals. You know, and I think a lot of people, I mean, that was a big misconception for me is that music education is, I love, I love music and I love teaching. So I must love teaching music. And I do, but that's only a, a percentage of the job. And, and the more real world experience that I've lived through, it's, it's more, it's, the teaching aspect is much less than the administrator aspect of the job, which I think is why, you know, if you, if you want to do music education, if your goal in life is to be a band director or an orchestra director or a choir director, you know, I do think you should go into music education and get that and pursue that with everything that you have, if that's your, your dream and your goal, you know. But like the article I shared with you guys earlier talked about music musicians going into music education because it's a fallback plan to perform or that kind of thing like that is not a good way to go because you're not doing yourself justice and you're not doing your students justice but also your your fallback plan is not music is not really music education at that point it's a little bit of teaching sprinkled with all with a whole bunch of like bs well, Ryan, how much of a percentage would you say is teaching to all the other stuff? I For mean, everyone that's listening. In, in total amount of energy devoted to the job. Like, obviously, when you're in class, you're teaching. But energy devoted to the job, I would say 25% is teaching and 75% is like, crisis management and, so, and the term that you use there that's the question that i have is for you being a music education ma major how much of your formal education did y'all do with administration in terms of crisis management none it was all it was all hypothetical situations you know like i took I took a class where it was like we, we would read this book and it's talking about like absolute worst case scenario. You're, you're like in the worst school in the state with like the student where the students are literally unruly. I mean, this is, these are the examples that they lay out for you. Like the kids are unruly and there's no funding for anything. And what would you do in that situation? I don't know because 90% of situations aren't like that. Like the amount of unruly kids I, I've taught are next to none because there, there aren't unruly kids, you know? <laughs> I don't even think that's a real scenario. And the reason why I say that is because all the stories that band directors tell me are completely different. Like that means that they're not preparing those people 
for what it's really going to be like to be a music educator. Like, I mean, some of the stories that I hear are like, oh, well, we're in middle school and this kid can actually do this, but this kid can't get out of his connections class because they treat the STEM part of the program extracurricular as higher than band. So this kid can't be in band because of this. Or they just switched our schedule around again, and now I have to deal with the fact that this kid can't be in band because of this. Or I got an email from the athletic director because some of my kids left stuff at the football field. And, you know, I'm get so to me, those are all like the the underlying drama things that come along with music education that why wouldn't that be talked about in a music education curriculum? Because that's 70, that 75, 70% of like stuff that's happening that you're going to have to deal with outside of, I just get to come in and teach. So, so here, I'll just say this because I know this to be true of the classes I took. And I know this to be true at other education at other colleges. I don't know how many colleges this is true at, um, but I know there are at least the one I attended and the handful and a handful of other ones that I've had friends attend. The music education courses aren't taught by people in music education. I had, I, I mean, music professors that haven't been in a public education classroom for 20 years. And that's not to say that, that's not to say that they shouldn't be teaching that, that they're not qualified to teach that, but you, you, you can't just read a book and go, all right, worst case scenario is um, there's literally a bomb falling from the sky aimed at your band room. What are you going to do? I'm going to kiss my butt goodbye because there's a bomb falling from the sky is what I'm going to do, but that's not a realistic situation. And if it is, that's like a 0.00001% chance of happening in real life. Like they flew over that school that day and dropped a heat seeking bomb aimed right at the band room. But right. Those, so there like, needs to be more emphasis on navigating the middle. Yeah. That's the equivalent of what I was being asked in some classes is like, what are you going to do when your kids literally don't show up for class? They're not, they're, there is no school. I can't imagine there being a school where kids just literally are in the building, but don't show up to class. And, and when we're in music where every kid doesn't, I'm not saying one or two don't skip. Let's be real. But like, we're, we're getting asked about like what happens when nobody shows up for your class. I don't know. Let's see. Let's, let's try it out next time we have this class because I'm not getting anything I'm going to need for it. <laughs> like, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus and I'm not saying that, you know, I didn't get a job because of where I went to school. Cause that's not the case, you know, but music educators need to be set up for real life. Like I, I didn't get the reason I know to promote myself is because I've been broke for most of my life because I was going to have a band director job and didn't get one. And I wasn't set up to know that, Hey, you should set up a music what you should set up a website with your work and your services that you do. Hey, you should, even though you're a music ed major, you should learn to write a little bit of music. Luckily, luckily, my, my percussion professor also did the technology stuff at that school. So I learned how to use Sibelius and I learned how to do um, a little bit of like recording stuff and a little bit of that. So like I came out of college with a bunch of skills, but no guidance in how to use those. So like I have a music education degree. I don't have a license anymore because I let it expire because when you apply for 200 jobs in five years, why am I going to spend thousands of more dollars to go back to school to renew my teaching certificate? I'm, I'm not, 
you know, and I don't think these are the things. I think everything is like, well, this is, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen, or this is the best thing that could possibly happen. Both of which in real life are very, very rare occurrences. And I don't think we spend enough time teaching people, you know, as you said, Landers, how to navigate the middle and how to navigate the waters they will actually be in. And I think also if you're a student <clears throat> or someone who's about to enter college listening to this podcast, I think these are some questions you should uh, come up with yourself when you're researching and, and uh, going to different colleges and, and exploring which school you want to go to. Check out some of the music programs, right? Do they have a music technology course that they're going to teach you? And when do they teach you that? Uh, does the teacher have experience with that? Do they have a, a marching band drill writing class, marching fundamentals? Uh, do they have a like music business class? Is that an elective? Is that part of the core curriculum? Right? Because you some of these, you know, uh, what counselors or people would say, oh yeah, we have those classes. But then when you actually kind of dig a little bit deeper, those are electives that are not part of the main degree program but based on maybe some of the performing groups if you're in the percussion ensemble or the string orchestra or whatnot maybe they rehearse during times that that class meets and you have to be in those performing ensembles so you cannot be in that class so just make sure if you're about to enter college that, that you're kind of doing your due diligence thinking again more in the long term once I graduate what skills do I need well, you need some management business skills. You need some financial skills. You need to be able to supply, again, what are some different ways you yourself can make some money? Drill writing, uh, writing music, teaching lessons online. And, and ask your counselor, ask your director, do you offer courses in that? When are they offered? If we were going to look at my four-year plan or five-year plan, and will I have to miss those courses if I have to be in a performing ensemble? All those points, John, just kind of ring true for like everything that I learned innately by being thrown into teaching at 17 that was not on the radar of being in college in music. And it's well, crazy. Think, I, it's crazy how much you learn in the world of experience versus collegiate education, right? Like, why? Why is it that in the world of experience, all of those things that you just listed off that it's important to start asking those questions? Like, some of those things rang true for the college that I went to, like we had a music technology course. One of the colleges had a, like a drill writing fundamentals course for music educators. But like, like you said, like music business, managerial, uh, financial accounting, like, like those things are important. And I mean, I know some of that stuff you learn like in undergrad when you're just like a general major, but is it, in, is it in their curriculum when you're a music education major? And is it required? And that's the question is like, do we treat this as its own little egg baby that says, because you're a music education major, ah, you don't need all this other stuff. You should have learned that in high school. Now you just need to learn all this other stuff. Well, there's still more skill sets that you can pick up in university that are going to be beneficial for you as you move into the next stage of your life that expand upon the things that you learned in high school that take the concepts a little bit further, right? Like, I can't remember a lot of the things that I learned in economics in high school, but I remember a lot of what I learned in my futures management course in college. I remember a lot of what I learned about in my marketing course in college. I remember a lot about what I learned about in my ethics course in college. Like those are courses that like spoke to the core of like who shaped who I was because I was in that age range to where I was figuring out a lot about myself 
and I wasn't just figuring out like what am I going to do in college because I felt like that was high school was trying to figure out what am I going to do in college and in college I was trying to figure out what am I going to do with the rest of my life so those decisions started becoming a lot more important and all the information that I was taking in started speaking to me in a lot different manner you know what I mean and it started connecting with me in a lot different manner you know like I think about you know uh my futures course one of the projects we had was we had to write a 20-year life plan no one had ever asked me to think 20 years in the future at the age of i don't remember how old i was i think i might have been like 24 and i'm i'm rounding 35 now so ask me to think 20 years in advance and like we had to put it on this giant project board and it had to be super detailed. Like he had all these rules about how the project had to be created. And we had three dynamics, which was like work, leisure, and um, I think it was like personal life. And when, you're, when you have to consciously like consider all of those things, like now you start thinking about how all of those things play into one another and how they connect to one another. So when we're talking about like what kind of curriculums need to be added or available, right? We talk about electives because the college, the, you know, the collegiate system loves electives, even though they love to structure systems that don't allow you to take electives, right? We love the idea of electives, I would say, right? Because it's like you get into a, a degree program, they say you can take electives, but then there's only certain electives that you can take right um but if we if we truly let that system play out the way that it's supposed to then students need to be armed with the information of what they actually need to go into the jobs that they plan on taking on in the future whether that's going to be educators whether that's going to be composers whether that's going to be because even you think about composers right they're composing day in and day out but they need to know how to function as a, um, as their own personal business, right? They need to know how to deal with music publishing, right? Like those are like, and I can't speak on what those courses exist for those people because I'm not in those universities, but I'm just saying like, those are, those are valid skill sets that we, we should be able to offer to those programs and those individuals that allow us to really breathe that room out for everybody so that they can really get into some of the information that they're going to be experiencing when they get into these job roles out in the, in the workforce in the future. Which, I, you know, I've said this in the past, like forever and a day ago, I don't think that high school nor college traditionally outside of like workforce programs and you know like traditional trade schools have typically ever prepared us for the jobs that we're supposedly supposed to be going into after that institution and i, I can't understand why we can't fix that system in america i i feel like part of it has to do with the fact that I don't think that people, uh, I don't think that internships are long enough. I don't think that they're varied enough either um, because I feel like they should, they should be moved up a little bit just because you don't really, I mean, you can, again, you can think that music education is one thing and you understand it from one vantage point, but until you actually get into the field and you're able to observe people on a consistent basis, and have conversations with them and talk about their journey, how they got to where they are, how, how much they like it, how comfortable they are, whether or not it's what they thought that it would be, um, then you're really not making a sound decision. So, and, and to me, as it stands now, it's okay, you go through the curriculum, then when you get ready to graduate, you start to, you know, second or uh, second to last year or the ultimate year, you start to, you know, do your student teaching and this, that, and whatever. And it's like, well, now if I figure out that there's all this other peripheral stuff that goes along with 
the the job that I don't like, it's kind of too late and I'm stuck now because I've already finished a degree program based off of that rather than, okay, hey, we're taking these introductory things that are kind of, you know, nominal, but I'm still consistently getting experience within the field. Now, that's not to say that that's a knock against institutions that may not do that because I do believe that the ultimate uh, responsibility lies upon the student to make those decisions. So I'm not holding a university responsible for that. However, I do feel like um, if universities are what we say that they're for, that they're for higher learning, then I feel that we can better facilitate that by making sure that students are better informed rather than just pumping them, you know, with a certain set of information, giving them a degree that says you regurgitated all of this information and the degree saying, hey, because you can regurgitate, regurgitate this amount of information, you deserve this job. Because there are tons of people that took the test that have the degrees, but they're awful educators, just like there are in any particular field. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that they have an actual passion for what it is that they're doing, and they have the skills to be able to do that consistently. So one of the things that I would say is if a person is considering getting a music education degree, um, which I personally, I can't say that I'll be for or against, I would say just Think about making sure that you know what your trajectory is, whether or not you want to teach in a conservatory, whether or not you want to freelance and teach a little bit, whether or not you want to go full time into teaching, whatever within some system, whether or not you want to create your own system, um, all of which are viable. I would say talk to other people that are in different realms of music education and find your path based on that because it's not everybody's path to get a degree and go immediately into teaching middle school or high school or elementary music. I don't think that's the right path for everybody. Some people are going to want to, hey, I have a personality that I'm more of a specialist. I want this caliber of students and I want to find a way that I can teach students that have this caliber, this uh, experience level, this level of desire and hunger you're going to be frustrated if your music education experience is, hey, this is the way that my mind works. This is the type of system that I need to be in. And then you go to some system where the kids don't care anything about it. And then you're at the high school. Let's talk about the fact that you probably can set up a good high school program, but the middle school program that feeds you is complete dumpster fire. Well, you have to deal with that and you need to be prepared to deal with that because again, that's something that's peripheral to what it is that you're trying to build that maybe you haven't thought about that. So I think that people should take their personality into consideration as well, because I know one of the things for me with regards to percussion education specifically is one of the draws for me was that I have this little section of the program within a total program and most of my directors value what I did and allowed me to run it the way that I felt that it should be run as long as it works within their overall system. But I think that again, every, every band director job isn't for everybody. Every music educator job isn't for everybody. You have to go in with your own goals because a lot of times we go in with interviews, we're thinking, well, I'm trying to get the job, but I feel like we should also feel so valued that I need to be thinking, is this the right place for me to work? Because I know that any person that has any sense would hire me because I have these skills, I'm marketable, I have, you know, whatever. But is this going to be the right system for me to build what it is that I envision building as a music educator as well? So I think we, we have to think a little bit broader. Um, you know, if you're thinking about going into music education, not just I want to get out and get a job. You can get out and get a job and be like a lot of music educators that I know that are absolutely miserable. They got health insurance. They got, they got, they got the summer off air quotes, but they hate their job because they hate the admin that they work with. They hate the athletic director. You know what I mean? They hate the schools that feed them and the other people that they work with. So 
I don't know. I think there's a lot more to consider rather than just, oh, I want to go into this because I think it's a safe job for me to get in music. Yeah, I think you brought up some really good points in terms of like, uh, not just theorizing or, you know, pontificating about what you think music education is, you know, and I think that's one of the advantages that our field has is that, you know, like I, I taught marching bands and did some in like during the school day and after the school day teaching, um, like just section coaching and whatnot throughout college, you know? So I got that experience and I got those teaching skills and luckily I wasn't thrown into a classroom the first time and just had a bunch of theory of like how to teach and how to do these things and then thrown into a real world situation. So, um, you know, since we're all kind of talking about the, like, if I would get a music ed degree, you know, obviously I, I have one. Um, I would tell anybody to make sure that if you're going into music ed, you're going into BA director of some sort of musical ensemble. You know, I had a conversation with a student of mine just this past year who was talking about, hey, I want to go into music education. I said, okay, what, what are your goals? Are your goals to be a band director? Are your goals to be a performer? Are your goals to do what I do for a living? Um, like, what, what are your goals? And, and, you know, that student said, my goal is to do what you do for a living. I said, time out. You don't need a music education degree to do what I do. You need more experiences, like, like the, um, <laughs> the amount of money I make teaching is not livable off of just that one skill. So it's, it's going through and like measuring what you want to do. Because if, if being a band director is not what you want to do, like Robert said, you're going to be miserable. You're going to hate your off summers when you're in 90 degree heat in the middle of band camp doing something you don't love. You're going to hate it when you're giving up your Saturdays for, you know, if you're a competitive group or you're a show choir that does competitions or you're just doing your band festival. Or you're at, or you get some school that plays their football games on Saturdays, which does exist, you know, like, you know, the nine to five band director, uh, you know, nine to five doesn't, doesn't exist, doesn't exist, you know, it's like, yeah, it's much earlier than nine and much or later than five, um, so you gotta you gotta look at that and and you're when you go into this you're devoting 35 years of your life to it in in theory you know and and the the ratio for teacher burnout especially in the music ed degree is quick and the music ed field is quick so i i i'll never tell students to not go into music education but I will tell them, like, you need to know these things up front. Here's the good, bad, and the ugly about it. And then you make the best, best, most informed decision for yourself based on that information. And nine times out of ten, they end up, they end up loving music. And they end up playing in, like, some sort of collegiate ensemble. But, but they don't go into music education unless they're, again, like, I want to go in and do this. And I think that's the most important part because again, since we're reaching, we're talking more to percussionists, you can teach marching band indoor and you don't need a music education degree. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why I don't really recommend students go get a music ed degree unless like what you said, Ryan, they've thought about it. They've weighed the pros and cons. That's something they want to do because, I'm oh, sorry, my phone showing me I have low battery. <laughs> because uh, you can still go get a job somewhere else and still be part of the musical sphere of percussion 
and not have to worry about all the everything else we've talked about with admin or angry parents or students not showing up or whatnot. So it all comes down to the individual person and how much research they have done about themselves and what is out in the world. Because like, again, for me, I've done other stuff and now I'm starting, I'm getting my music certification because I want to be a director. And so then I'm going to start my music journey and that's fine that I took some time off and did engineering and math and, and performing music. And I didn't go straight into the music education teaching. You as an individual have to find what works for you and who you are as a person. I think that's all good. <laughs> okay. Thanks, E. <laughs> no, now, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I can't speak on music education in terms of a degree because I didn't get a music education degree. I can't say that people should or should not because I don't, I feel like I don't have a dog in the, a, a dog in the fight. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I I, I kind of got <laughs> I I agree with you just because I the only reason why I didn't get one is because I knew I didn't want to be a band director. Um, I just knew I wanted to do music, and like John said, I knew being able to teach percussion, WGI, DCI, whatever, I could do that without a degree. Right, and I think that's the realm. I mean, I think I got turned off from it very quickly by my experience in my first semester in college. But I think after that experience, even when I had the opportunity to go back into it, I got turned away from it because of the realization that, no, I don't ultimately see myself making this a lifelong commitment to be a band director. Thinking about my experiences with like my high school and middle school band directors, like I couldn't see myself doing that. And it wasn't something that I was like waking up saying, I can't wait to go do that when I graduate college. You know, I, 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 that dream never got in front of me. You know what I mean? Um, so I definitely think you, I definitely think it has to be a sincere passion in order for you to want to pursue it. And, uh, and I think once you find out what your sincere passion is, th this is one thing that I'll say, right? Once you find out what your sincere passion is, it's going to be so overwhelmingly um, in front of your face that you're not going to be able to ignore it. And I say that because like throughout my life, like I felt like I've always been placed in this position to just talk, share information with people. Doesn't matter how, doesn't matter where, share information with people. Even when I want to be quiet, I'm thrown into a situation where now I got to talk again. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter where I'm at. Can you come and share something with us real quick? Okay. Just go. Me as a person, I think I find energy in myself and being quiet, being home, my humble abode. It's my house. I love being with my family, just us, very private person. But there are times when I do like to get out and share. But I find it that I'm put on this reason to share information. I'm like a digital hub for information in terms of this earth. That's part of my mission. And I think God gave me the ability to speak. I think God gave me that poise, that charisma to be able to share and to be able to conversate with other individuals in that manner. And no matter how much I want to run from that, that's my mission. You know what I'm saying? And it's like time after time after time again, when something's meant for you, you're not going to be able to ignore it no matter how much you want. It's going to keep throwing itself right back in your face over and over and over and over again. And here we are on a podcast talking again. Here we go. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, if that's going to be your mission, 
and it's going to be educating students in the ways of music, you're not going to be able to put it down. You're not going to be able to run away from it. It's not going to be something that's going to, you're going to be able to walk away from. It's going to come back with fury, with fire, with emotion. And it's going to be so overwhelming that you're going to have to do it. And like, I feel like life has a way of always pushing us in that direction of where we need to go, making you hear the things that you need to hear right at the right moment to where it needs to happen. And that's even saying for the people that are listening to this podcast right now, somebody is going to be hearing this exact conversation and it is going to be the conversation that you need to hear at this exact moment that's telling you, you need to be calling somebody, signing that paperwork, whatever it is that's putting you in the position to be where you need to be, whether that's going into that music education program, whether it's turning away from that music education program, going in the music industry, going in the music business, going into something entirely different, business, accounting, whatever it is, right? Your fate is, is pushing you where you need to go. And every experience that you have in life is swirling around you in the direction where you need to go all you got to do is open up your ears a little bit and listen and it's telling you where you need to go i agree um i think that it's it's very important to understand specifically um people that are in the age range where you are in college there's so much uncertainty and it's, it, you know, being in that 18 and 20s range, you know, there's so many things that you don't know. But I do agree, like, like E said, there are a lot of things that, you know, the, there's, there's a way for you to get to where you are. And even if it's through a misstep, you know, it's ultimately guiding you to where you are because I, I 100% did not intend on coming to Atlanta to be a percussion educator primarily. Um, It was just something that I I reached out to, you know, my old caption head at Glassman to find, you know, a job every now and then so that I could have some extra income. And, you know, I I liked doing it so much. Eventually I, you know, got offered a director job and eventually that director job was two days a week. And then I got another one where I was just like, okay, now I'm teaching at two schools you know, teaching four classes five days a week, you know, and going to their feeder programs. And it kind of snowballed into this, but this wasn't what I actually intended on doing because I feel like had I intended on doing this, one, I might have gone to another school. It's okay, Troy, I still love you. Um, And I also probably would have gotten a music education degree because I would have come at it that way. However, I still think that that would have been the wrong move for me. I don't think that I would be where I am or I don't think that I would have the passion for trying to do music education in the way that is, um, that is uh, authentic to me if I had gone that route. So I do think it's important to understand that you, even though you may get inspiration from different people, your route is as specific as your fingerprint And it's not going to be the same as anyone else. So even though you can draw inspiration from other people, don't try to copy their path. Like just go with what is authentic for you. And sometimes what that means is what is the next right step for me? And for me in college, it was changing my major from business to music industry, which involved business. And then it was moving to Atlanta and just teaching. And then the next thing was, oh, okay, being a director of percussion. And then it was like, oh, I really like creating my own curriculums. I like doing this and then kind of going from there and allowing my gigging and all the other, you know, skills that I built from the music industry side to allow me to do what it is that I really want to do. Because I think that's the thing that I'm noticing is the more I go along, there isn't an actual template for what it is that I really want to do. You know what I mean? I kind of have to make it up myself. Right. You're creating your own template. So when it comes down to it, even like Ryan's student was saying that he wants to do what Ryan does, 
he's not going to do it exactly like Ryan and his path probably isn't going to be that he applies for 200 places and then decides, I think that I probably am a composer and like, this is what I should do. You know what I mean? But I feel like, you know, God has a way of getting everyone wherever they're supposed to be. And I think we just have to allow that to happen because I know in my early twenties, I was very, just like, I have to know exactly what I'm going to do. Next thing is going to happen like this, because there's that pressure of college, you know, and your parents and everything else of like, you should know what to do by this time. You should have your life figured out. That's BS. Like a lot of the great ideas and like paths of where we should go are things that we stumble upon that aren't necessarily something that you just planned it out that way. It was like, wow, okay, I kind of discovered this and like, this is it. Like, you know, my, my, my brain is on fire now that I'm doing this thing and I didn't even really plan on doing it that way. So I think don't be afraid, you know, to create your own template as to what it is that you want to do and how you're going to educate students through music. It doesn't have to be through any any particular system that's already there. You could start your own school. You could work in a conservatory. You could just have a private lesson studio and do other stuff on the side. Like there's so many different opportunities for you. And I feel like if you're going into music education, you should go into it with that in mind rather than again, it being a means to an end of like, I'm gonna get out and get this job. Ryan, do you have anything to add before I kind of wrap up this conversation? No, I think I think Alanders and, and Robert wrapped it up really nicely of just figure out what your path is and then go after that and, and be flexible because your path will lead you in one direction. Like I was going to be a band director and, you know, the obstacles got put in my way. And eventually I said, all right, I'm already doing this for a little bit of money. Let's Let's just go at this thing full force and max it out. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful to be where I am today. Um, and, you know, we'll hopefully be grateful where I end up, you know, in 10 years from now. Cool, man. Cool, guys. Awesome. Well, you guys are going to hate me because I have like three things to say before I wrap up. I want to be the star of the show. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to say one thing that we talked about earlier uh, regarding music education, how um, we believe there's so many other different facets of life that also need to be included in the music education degree. We've already talked about that, finances, marketing, business, management, etc. And the question, I would, I would, this comes from if I were a student, questioning what happens if those electives, those coursework are not offered at the school? What do you do? And the answer or an idea I like to propose is at that point, it comes down to the director of the studio to provide those opportunities for the students. And I, I wanna give a shout out to uh, TCU and, and Dr. West. One really great aspect of that program is that that's right gotta got gotta wrap some tcu go frogs <laughs> but yeah no it's not it's a horn frog it's not a ribbit they shoot blood out of the, their eyes and they kill their prey that way it's pretty cool okay stop it <laughs> but no like he he understood that with the amount of curriculum that's already on the music ed degree and how students are taking five years to get through that program he takes time out of the studio we have studio class every monday and each whether freshman sophomore junior senior they'd have to perform in front of the studio right he would take some times throughout the year and invite director friends of his or friends in the city come out that are not doing music and they would talk about important aspects that we've already talked about uh, sometimes it was about taxes what do you do if you have a a job how do you save money on taxes or how do you run a private percussion lesson studio or, or how should you, what's the life of a gigging musician or what are some other opportunities outside of music education? So he took time out of his studio 
class, instead of having students perform in front of each other, and he knew that maybe business, music business was not offered at TCU, he would take time out and bring in guest speakers and they would talk about their experiences. So if you're a student and you're finding and you're looking and you don't see a college that you like that offers boom, boom, boom these classes, I and you're a director at that school that realizes that or a student asks you why that's not offered, I think for you, it, t it falls upon your shoulders to somehow provide that educational aspect to your student. So that was one thing I just wanted to, to say. Oh, crap, I have to remember everything else. Um, the second thing, going back, I think it was Ryan, you were saying about, you know, if you're going into music ed, you have to, be prepared to do that 35 years or something along those lines. For me, I think that's super scary. And I think even in today's society, you don't really see people doing jobs for 35 years anymore in, in any field. I think people are jumping around a lot more. And I think if you're, again, you're going into music ed, you're about to graduate, don't worry about being in this job for 35 years. Because I, I talked to the people who hired me, and they were like, well, what do you want to do with the program? And I was like, this is, these are my goals, blah, 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 blah. But then I also told them, I'm, my mindset is three to five years. Because in Texas, the burnout's a real thing. And a lot of times, people are quitting because it's, it's overwhelming, right? So don't feel like you're locked in. And this kind of goes back to what everyone else was saying. Be flexible, because opportunities come and opportunities go. And you don't have to stay in the job or your position in life forever. So just because you're getting this degree or maybe a different degree, your passions will change. Uh, new opportunities will arise. Things, things will come up. So don't feel like you have to get this job and stay in for 35 years or more. That was the second thing I want to say. And the third thing, uh, my video turned off for a while because I was kind of searching on Instagram because there are a couple of posts I've seen. I follow some, you know, inspirational speakers and some entrepreneur money, financial type things. I don't remember everything on this post I saw, but it was like basically the gist of you have to have like six different hobbies. You have to have like a hobby that fulfills your passion. You need a hobby that's going to make you money. You need a hobby that's going to educate yourself. You need a hobby that's going to keep you in shape. You need a hobby that's, uh, you know, going to keep you, like, healthy, I think, for maybe, like, a food type of thing. I don't remember the sixth one, but you could think maybe you need a hobby to spend time with your family or friends or, like, social outing. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, I think those were the main three things. Any discussion on what I've said real quick before I say the last wrap-up on why we're talking about music education? I like the hobby. I like the hobby thing because I, I feel like it's a very underutilized uh, trait for people that they, they don't consider that a you can have multiple hobbies and b that multiple hobbies can serve multiple purposes. Right. Like I definitely value my percussive knowledge, but I definitely think it is a very glorified hobby of mine that has allowed me to earn income. In, a, in, in association with other things that I do, right? Because I, I know that there are, you know, I know it's not a full-time job of mine, like I have a full-time job at a credit union, but I do percussion as a hobby, but I also have experience in it, but it also allows me to earn income. But it also serves a purpose for me to have fun in, because I do enjoy it, but it also is recreational because I enjoy watching it. But you know how there are some people that like they enjoy earning income in certain things, but they don't enjoy watching it. You know what I mean? So you can have multiple hobbies that have different facets and different, you know, um, reasons, rhymes, et cetera. So I really like what you said there, because I, I think people look at hobbies that, you know, they think of the traditional idea of a hobby to where it's like it's building a toy model. It's boring and it's something you do when it's raining outside. Like, I don't, I don't only play drums when it's raining outside. I like going and playing drums when it's sunny outside. I actually like going and being out with drums when it's brittle and hot and pouring sweat outside. That's my favorite time to be out amongst drums. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things to where it's like it can be a multitude of things 
but you can have a, a range of different hobbies that you can have. And it just makes you a more well-rounded person. You know what I mean? Because you have multiple different things that you can dip into depending upon what your scenario brings you. I like it. Yeah. The hey, well-rounded you- person thing is, is key, you know, and I think that's a, that's a huge thing that a lot of people don't think about, especially in music, but yeah. And you could switch it out from any words, hobby, side hustles, passion, job, whatever. I think you definitely need different facets, different activities to do because you can get burned out doing the same thing every day, all the time. And at that point, that's not beneficial to anyone. Uh, The last thing uh, I want to say and kind of wrap up this conversation is the reason I think we started this conversation about music education is because we saw an article online that came out. I think Ryan, you sent to us or, or, Mm -hmm. I don't remember who. Uh, I don't exactly remember the article title or who it's by. Do you guys remember exactly? I want that to be a source for other people. Yep, it's by Drew Tucker and it's on Medium. On the Medium uh, app or website, you can find it, but it's by uh, Andrew Tucker or Drew Tucker. He's a well-known musician, artist. I think he he created Mallet Lab. Is that correct? Yeah. Isn't he uh, the, the vibraphone? In uh, yep. improviser, innovative yeah, artist, or innovative percussion. Um, I think he's in Georgia now, and uh, but he wrote yep. this article. I think it was about 2017. And I think the the article uh, I, can't, I can't quote it exactly. It was more like it said like don't go into music ed or why you should not go into music education. And I think that was an important topic, which I'm I feel like we've talked about in this podcast in depth. Uh, but if anyone who's listening has more conversations or would like to join the conversation, uh, you can always reach out to us on the different social media platforms. I'm not really good with knowing all the names, so I'm going to pass it to my man, Landis Fraser, to uh, post all that. We're currently on one social media platform, which is Instagram, which we would love to connect with some more folks on Instagram. But you can hit us at Volta Percussion on Instagram. We are on YouTube, so you can watch this podcast on YouTube and interact with us there. You can also send us an email at VoltaPercussion at gmail.com. We definitely check the email and we respond. So, and we would love to hear anything that you guys out there that are listening that would uh, spark your interest that could maybe turn into a topic that we talk about in future podcasts coming soon. We drop a podcast every single week. Sometimes we drop multiple uh, parts throughout the week. So we would love to start getting some integrated topics that we hear from some of our fans across the world. So shout out, uh, this is our first shout out to all the folks that are listening to Volta all around the world, in Europe, Australia, um, South America, everywhere. We really appreciate y'all listening and We hope that you gain something from uh, our conversations because really it's just four friends talking about music, life, and the pursuit of happiness. So (laughs) (laughs) thank you. Cut. (laughs) That's the signature. (laughs) 